Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Wignall. I'm a clinical psychologist and the founder of The Friendly Mind, a free weekly newsletter where I share practical, evidence based advice for emotional health and well being. Today, we're going to talk about self doubt and imposter syndrome. Specifically, I'm going to share with you a case study about a former client of mine who was actually a nuclear physicist who struggled tremendously with self-doubt, insecurity, imposter syndrome, stuff like that, who after a couple of months of working together, we finally cracked the code on her self-doubt and figured out how to boost her confidence tremendously. So this is the story of Katie, a former client of mine. I'm calling her Katie. It wasn't actually a real name, but to preserve confidentiality, we're going to call her Katie. And I still remember the first thing she said to me. I'm going to check out my notes here. It was one of our first meetings and she said, you know, the worst part about imposter syndrome isn't the anxiety or lack of confidence. It's the frustration. It's maddening to know that I'm just as competent as everyone else I work with, but to constantly feel like I'm not in their league. So that's what Katie said to me in one of our very first meetings together. Now, the thing about Katie is, <laughs> even if you'd only met her and chatted with her for a few minutes, you would realize that she was nothing if not competent. She had received full scholarships to two very prestigious Ivy League universities. She graduated top of her class in physics, and then she went on right after school to get a very prestigious position at a uh, national lab doing classified research for the Department of Energy. So just incredibly accomplished academically, but it wasn't just academic smarts. She was, Katie was very, she was charming. She was funny. She was creative. She had a wonderful group of friends. She had a great close friend group. She was in a really healthy, stable, satisfying romantic relationship. And on top of all that, she ran marathons in her spare time. So just incredibly accomplished, personable, creative person. And to be honest, like when I first started working with Katie, I think I was the one who was feeling even more insecure because I was thinking, how am I supposed to help someone like this? I mean, she easily had 25 IQ points on me. So I really started having my own kind of self-doubt, insecurity issues when I first got to know Katie because she was so impressive in so many different ways. But... Here's the thing, despite all of her gifts and talents, Katie had a lot of insecurity, specifically at work. Remember, she's like 23, 24, something like that, had just started her first real job coming out of, out of academia, out of school. And she was plagued with a lot of self-doubt and imposter syndrome, um, constantly kind of comparing herself to her colleagues and doubting her own abilities, which were tremendous. <laughs> she struggled to speak her mind during meetings. This is one of the things she really talked a lot about, how she would have, she'd have a good idea and she'd be about to share it, but then she would immediately start doubting herself and thinking, oh, I'm going to sound dumb. I'm going to look foolish. So I won't share it. She was holding back her ideas. She also really struggled with presenting and speaking in front of her colleagues at work, which was ironic because she was actually a very good public speaker. She was <laughs> in high school. She was the captain of her debate team. So she was really good at speaking in public and even speaking extemporaneously about complicated subjects, especially stuff she cared a lot about like physics. But she had this strange thing where as soon as she got to speak in front of her colleagues or people at work, she kind of froze up and got really anxious to the point of panic, like almost having panic attacks when she considered speaking up or having to speak up. And as a result of this, she started passing on and giving up opportunities to do new projects and assignments if they involved public speaking and presenting. And of course, this was really disappointing and she got really kind of ashamed of herself for passing up these great opportunities just because she got so anxious doing it. So that was Katie's situation when she came in. And to be totally honest, for the first, I don't know, month or so, we didn't make a whole lot of progress figuring out sort of what was at the root or core of Katie's self-doubt and imposter syndrome. We kind of bumbled around for a while. My first sort of theory of what might be going on with Katie was sort of started with the idea that her confidence problems really were centered around work. She seemed to not struggle with confidence at all or self-doubt in other aspects of her life, but it was this job for some reason. So my first, the place my mind went first was maybe this is kind of a structural problem. Structural in the sense of she's a woman working in a predominantly male field. So maybe a lot of her anxiety and self-doubt was the result of some kind of sort of subtle institutional or structural discrimination, right? Because she was a woman. So we talked about this. I, I remember what Katie said to me, she said, yeah, you know, in some ways I wish this was the result of discrimination because then I could have an explanation for what's going on. But in reality, it turns out for actually her entire life, she had had a surprising number of really positive female role models 
in and around physics and education and work. In fact, her mom was actually a really successful physicist. She had great mentors and teachers, female mentors and teachers through a lot of her training and education. And even her current job, she had, I think, two or three really close colleagues who were women and who she looked up to, but also felt close with. And so we, we kind of ended up ruling that one out because it just didn't really match with her, with her experience. And the next theory we went to was one I see a lot in my work. And I work primarily with kind of anxious high achievers. People who are very ambitious, very hardworking, very smart, high achieving, but just kind of run hot. They have a lot of anxiety, a lot of insomnia, a lot of self-doubt, imposter syndrome, stuff like that. And one of the big causes I see with these folks is that there is a conflict between the career and the work they're currently doing and what deep down they actually want to be doing. So the classic example of this is the, think of the guy who has three or four generations of doctors in his family, you know, and so he is just sort of groomed from a young age to go into medicine because that's what all the men in his family do. But turns out he becomes a doctor. He's very good at it, probably very successful, but actually he doesn't like it. <laughs> and what he'd rather be doing is playing music or teaching or maybe nuclear physics, who knows, right? But the point is, they spend, people like this, they get in this trap of doing and pursuing work in a career based on what other people think they should do. And as a result, kind of inhibiting or avoiding what they actually want to do. And this conflict very often can cause a lot of what we think of as emotional symptoms. So sometimes it results in depression, but often it results in anxiety, sort of unexplained anxiety. So anyway, this was, I thought, a pretty good theory. So I, we, Katie and I kind of talked about this <laughs> and this one fell flat pretty quickly because it didn't take long to realize that Katie was absolutely passionate about this work. Like she was just an utter and complete nerd <laughs> for nuclear physics of all things. And this, in a lot of ways, this was her dream job. Like she just absolutely loved it. People who were newer were like, she, this is the perfect job for her. And it was what, it's true, she had been on this path since she was a little kid, but it was just, I mean, she just lit up when she started talking about her work. And in fact, this is part of what was so frustrating to her about this self-doubt and confidence stuff, because she's doing the very thing she loves and is good at and is passionate about. So again, there's another theory, it hits the dust. <laughs> that one didn't turn out too well. Now, at this point, my own, again, my own self-doubt and insecurities were really starting to rear their ugly heads again. I was thinking like, man, I don't, I don't know if I can help her. These are two of my best, my best ideas. We've been talking for over a month and I really feel just as lost as I was at the beginning when we first started working together. So I was really doubting my own abilities to help Katie and was even considering, well, who could I refer her to? Because I don't know if I'm being helpful. So maybe I should refer her to someone else who can help her better than I can. And then one day at the end of a session working together, she was literally, we were walking out the door and she said something to me. I'm going to pull this up on my, on my screen here. She said in this sort of offhanded way as she was leaving my office, you know, it's annoying. If I'm so smart, how come I can't figure this out? And for whatever reason, that, that idea that if I'm so smart, it just sort of stuck in my head. <laughs> and I found myself the rest of the day, unfortunately, as I was talking to a couple other clients, this, this thought kept coming back to me about Katie and what she said about, if I'm so smart, how come I can't figure this out? And then for some reason, it sort of clicked in my brain that she, in some ways she was too smart. <laughs> in effect, Katie was outsmarting her emotional struggles by intellectualizing, by using that big, powerful, impressive mind of hers to avoid how she was feeling emotionally. And this avoidance, this using of the intellect to avoid emotions could actually be at the core of her anxiety and self-doubt and imposter syndrome, all of those insecurities. And frankly, I was <laughs> starting to feel kind of frustrated. Note the parallel processes. I'm feeling a lot of what Katie's feeling, the self-doubt, the frustration. But anyway, I was frustrated because it was such a, it's such a simple, obvious thing in my line of work. This, this process happens all the time, but I had sort of fallen into a similar mistake as Katie, which was assuming that this problem was more complex than it really was. And in reality, while it was a tough problem, it wasn't especially complicated. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk you through kind of this theory that I came up with to explain her, her anxiety and her self-doubt. And this is what I proposed to her in our, in our next session. So 
she came in and I, I told her, you know, Katie, I don't actually think you have a confidence problem. I think you have an emotional confidence problem. <laughs> so I said this and I could see her, she had this kind of very skeptical, but slightly curious look on her face. And she said, okay, go on. Like, what does that mean exactly? So I shared, I continued kind of sharing this theory, which was that I don't think, you know, I, I was telling her, Katie, I don't think you lack confidence in your abilities at work. The physics, the presenting, even the sharing of ideas as you and I, and frankly, anyone who knows you knows perfectly well, you are an extremely competent and confident person in almost every area of your life. And she kind of agreed with this uh, and not, sort of nodded and I, I continued going. Um, and I said, you know, Katie, I think where you lack confidence is this very specific situation. It's in the presence of anxiety specifically. When you get anxious, that's when you start lacking confidence. Precisely because you have been pretty confident and competent in almost every area of your life since you were a kid. All of a sudden now, really for the first time in your life, this new job coming out of school, you are experiencing almost for the first time acute, significant bouts of anxiety. And that's something you haven't had any practice really dealing with and learning and becoming skilled at managing. So you're, you're having to deal with anxiety all of a sudden, almost for the first time. And so understandably, your confidence dealing with that anxiety is not very high. It's pretty low. Now, as I was describing this, I could see the wheels starting to kind of turn through her eyes. I could sort of see that she was chewing on this. And while I don't normally sort of just kind of lay out a big theory like this for my clients, something about this situation, you know, gave me the impulse to do that. So I, I kind of kept going. So I told her, I don't think it's that you lack confidence in yourself as a person or as a physicist. You lack confidence in your ability to handle anxiety, moments of high anxiety. And so far, your go-to strategy for dealing with that anxiety, what you've kind of unconsciously developed as a coping mechanism, has been this idea of intellectualizing. You, as soon as you start feeling anxious, you quickly go into your head, right? You start doing what you do best, frankly, thinking analytically, problem solving, right? Solutioning, trying to figure out the answer to this problem. And that takes the form of self-doubt, comparisons, worrying, all these mental activities that look a lot like problem solving, except for they're not actually helpful and they make you more anxious in the long term. Now, as usual, she was very bright and she was tracking really closely and she interrupted me and she said, well, okay, but if, if, you know, if all this self-doubt and worry makes me anxious and I, we've been talking about that for, for a while now, I know that. So why do I keep doing it if it only makes me more anxious? That's a great question, <laughs> right? And so I, what I, I flipped it back on her and I said, the key, and this is pretty subtle, but I see this a lot in my own work. The key is that you have to distinguish between very short-term effects and longer-term effects. So yes, in the long run, self-doubt, worry, social comparisons, they absolutely make you more anxious, more insecure. They chip away at and erode your self-confidence for sure. But what's key to see is in the very short term, like in the moments or even seconds after feeling anxious, those same things, self-doubt, worry, social comparisons that lead to anxiety long-term, they actually give you some relief from anxiety in the very short term because they allow you to avoid or distract from the feeling, the emotion, feeling anxious or panicky, and instead go up into your head and to start thinking. And very temporarily, very briefly, that feels good. It's a relief. You're distracting yourself. So I was explaining this <laughs> and she was taking it all in and then she made a really insightful connection or insight, I think. And she said, I put my notes here. She said, I'm like an addict, but my drug is thinking. When I'm anxious and uncertain, I immediately start thinking because it distracts me from feeling bad. Bingo. <laughs> that is exactly what's going on. Of course, she didn't do this intentionally, like so much of our behavior. It kind of came about slowly as an unconscious or kind of semi-conscious habit that built up over time. The way to think about this, and this is how I explained it to Katie, is... Her problem wasn't with her you know, relationship with her colleagues or even her own abilities and confidence. Really where the problem was, was her relationship with her emotions, specifically her relationship with anxiety. 
early on in her new job, she learned that if she got anxious, this really uncomfortable sensation she wasn't normally used to experiencing, she learned that she could temporarily avoid it and get rid of it if she went up into her head, if she started problem solving. And that took the form of worrying and social comparison and self-doubt and all that stuff. And in the very short term, it, it worked, quote unquote, right? It kind of worked in that it distracted from that from that anxiety and feeling bad. But of course, the long-term effect was this really frustrating phenomena of feeling more and more anxious, less and less confident, despite knowing intellectually that she was perfectly competent and really should be confident. There was no reason for her not to be confident. So this was probably <laughs> the most excited I'd ever seen Katie at this point because she took this theory and then she made another connection, which I think was really important. And it got at that, the bit of frustration. And what she said was, I was so frustrated because I don't actually have a general confidence problem, but I was insisting to myself that I did. I was feeling anxious for a completely different reason because I was dealing with anxiety the wrong way. I just think that was a perfect kind of encapsulation of what we had been talking about, but also critically for her, it explained the frustration piece. And so that insight, I think, really kicked off the next stage of our work together, which was where we actually got to work, working on this problem of self-doubt. And I'm going to explain to you what that work looked like. And it involved three specific skills that I worked with Katie to develop. So over the next couple months, Katie and I worked on almost exclusively, we kind of really tightened up our focus and worked on building three really important skills that would help her change her relationship to anxiety, to start to manage it in a healthier, more productive way so that she didn't need the self-doubt and the worry and the social comparisons as this kind of primitive defense mechanism to avoid anxiety. Of course, because Katie was so good at problem solving and analytical thinking, it was a difficult process. Like it was not, it did not come naturally to her. The natural thing for her to do is when she, to go right to her head. So it took a little while for her to get better at catching herself intellectualizing, going to her head in response to anxiety and instead to start to do something different. But it did happen. She worked at it. She was a hard worker. She was willing to do it, even though it was uncomfortable. And as you'll see later on, it really led to some, some fruitful things. And she really started to improve and ultimately felt a whole lot better. But um, right now I want to describe in detail the three skills that we worked on and built up together over the course of a couple months in our work together. The first one was emotional awareness. Now, like I said before, Katie was, she's very bright. She even she had very good emotional, emotional intelligence. She was very self-aware in general, but like a lot of us, she had this tendency when, when something felt bad internally, especially anxiety, because she didn't have a lot of experience with anxiety. She tended to kind of ignore it, right? She would, there would be little bits of anxiety, but she'd kind of ignore it and ignore it and hope it would go away. But then of course, as usually happens. <laughs> These things get bigger and they snowball and they eventually they would turn into so much anxiety that she'd have to confront it. What we, emotional awareness, what this skill is about is it's about noticing difficult emotions early when they're still relatively small and minor. And instead of running away from them or avoiding them, turning into them and getting curious about them, kind of leaning into them. So Emotional awareness is about identifying and tuning into difficult emotions. And in Katie's case, it was anxiety. Doing it early so that you can actually address a difficult emotion like anxiety when it's small before it balloons into this big, overwhelming feeling like panic or major anxiety. So that was the first skill that we worked on. The second one was emotional validation. Now, because difficult emotions like anxiety feel bad, understandably, we don't want to feel bad anymore. So we do something to try and get rid of the anxiety. And what this ends up doing, if you do this a lot, you develop this mindset where anxiety is a bad thing. It's an enemy. It's a problem you have to solve or get rid of or avoid. And this is what happened to Katie. She really started to think of anxiety as this bad thing. And in fact, she came to see me because she said, you know, I've got this problem, this anxiety problem. And while that's understandable, it's not actually true. Just because anxiety feels bad doesn't mean it's a threat or dangerous or even a problem. And that's what Katie had to learn. And the most important skill she needed to develop to change this mindset was validation. Now, validation, the, the meaning is right there in the word valid. To validate ourselves or even someone else means to remind ourselves that what we're feeling, no matter how painful or uncomfortable, it's valid. It's okay. It's understandable. So Katie had to get good 
at reminding herself that just because I feel anxious, that doesn't mean something's wrong or something's bad. We all get anxious sometimes. It's actually really normal. So Katie built up this process and she did two little things that I think really helped with validation. The first is she had this little mantra, which is just because it feels bad doesn't mean it is bad. Just because it feels bad doesn't mean it is bad. So that was really important to remind herself when she felt anxious. The second thing she did is she developed this little trick where she externalized her anxiety by giving it a name. <laughs> she started to call her anxiety Penny Panic. And she said, oh, there's Penny Panic again. And what this does is it, it again, it, it externalizes your anxiety. So you start to think of your anxiety as it's this thing in me, but it doesn't define me. It's not the whole of me, right? It's this part of my experience. And it also kind of humanizes it a little bit. You start to think of your anxiety as a person instead of as a problem. And that really helps to shift your mindset away from this anxiety as the enemy and more towards anxiety is, it's kind of like a friend, like a good friend who's giving you advice, who thinks you're in danger. And they're a little confused because you aren't actually in danger, but they're well-intentioned nonetheless. So validation is about reminding yourself again, and this is what it took Katie a while to do, but eventually she really internalized this idea. My anxiety is not bad. It's normal. It's understandable. It doesn't feel good. I wish I wasn't feeling anxious, but I'm okay. It's not bad that I'm feeling anxious, no matter how uncomfortable it is. So that was emotional validation. Now, the third skill, which in some ways was the hardest, was willingness. Now, because Katie was such a problem solver, it's literally what she did for her job. It's what she was best at in a lot of ways. Her instinct was when I feel anxious, it's a problem, I have to solve it. I gotta make it go away. If there's a problem, I'm gonna solve it and then it's not gonna be a problem anymore. But eventually, as she started to internalize this idea of validating the anxiety as something that's normal and okay, not a problem, she became less and less afraid of it. And instead of seeing it as a problem, she saw it as, again, like a friend who was giving her some advice that maybe it wasn't especially well-informed advice and maybe she didn't actually wanna take the advice, but it didn't mean the friend is bad or, or ill-intentioned, right? So instead of focusing on the anxiety when she got anxious, she briefly, she acknowledged it and then validated it. But then instead of trying to get rid of it and putting her, all of her energy into the anxiety, she tried, she worked on accepting it. This is what it is. And I can continue to move on and live my life, share ideas, present new topics at work, do things. I can take action without having dealt with the anxiety. I don't have to deal with the anxiety. It can just be there. I can allow it to be there despite it being uncomfortable and still get on with my life anyway. And I'm gonna to be totally willing to do that, to have the anxiety. And that's a hard one, but it requires this, this ability, willingness. So the final stage of our work, this final skill, was really building up what I call emotional endurance. Training Katie to realize and we used her background as a runner to kind of, to make this analogy here, but it's like running's hard. And to get good at it, you have to build up your endurance, your tolerance for discomfort. Your muscles are telling you, oh, we don't wanna do this anymore, let's stop. And to get better as a runner, you have to push through that and keep going anyway. So similarly with anxiety, Katie learned to acknowledge and validate and accept her anxiety and to tolerate it, to be willing to have it and get on with things anyway. And we did that slowly and progressively. We worked up toward it. It's a hard thing, but it started with this, this mindset shift of anxiety is uncomfortable, but it's not bad. It's not an enemy out to get me. So those were the three skills that ultimately helped Katie change her relationship with anxiety. And as a result, develop more emotional confidence, develop her ability and her belief that she could get anxious and still do what she wanted to do anyway, despite feeling anxiety. Now, within a few months of, of doing this work together, Katie was really off to the races. Of course, she still felt anxious from time to time, but her whole view of what anxiety meant was different. She normalized, she said, this is okay, this is normal. I'm in a situation doing important, challenging, difficult work. And so getting anxious from time to time, that's actually a good sign because it means I'm stretching myself and I'm pushing myself to grow and develop. And growth and development always are uncomfortable to some extent. So she really went, she did kind of a 180 on her anxiety from where it was bad and the enemy and something she had to get rid of or solve to really, it was like, it was helpful. It was a sign, it was a good sign that she was pushing herself and trying new things. So as she did that, as she sort of developed this emotional confidence, what happened was she didn't need to intellectualize anymore. She didn't need 
to w the worry and the self-doubt and the comparisons, the imposter syndrome. Remember, those were serving the function. Their job was to help her deal with anxiety. That was the only way she knew how to deal with it. It was basically to avoid it by intellectualizing. But as she developed this new set of skills for dealing with and managing anxiety in a healthy and productive way, she essentially put self-doubt and worry out of a job because she didn't need them anymore. She had a better way to deal with anxiety. And that's, that's what happened within a few months. Her confidence at work went right up to the same level as her confidence in other er uh, every other aspect of her life. But the key, the absolute key was at the root of this problem was she had an unhelpful relationship with anxiety. And by learning these three skills, um, emotional awareness, emotional validation, and willingness, she was able to change her relationship to anxiety. And as a result, increase her confidence in her ability to deal with it well and continue to do her work and whatever was meaningful to her. Okay, so that's Katie's story. Now, of course, her story, like all of our stories, is unique and different in, in a lot of important ways. And so none of if you struggle with self-doubt or imposter syndrome or anxiety, you obviously can't just copy and paste this playbook because we're all different, right? And it, the timelines, how long things take to work, what exactly is the, at the root of things, these are all a little bit different for everybody. But that being said, I still think there's a lot of kind of universal principles in Katie's story that can help any of us who struggle with low self-confidence, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, and really insecurity of, of any kind. And so what I thought I'd do here at the end is I'm going to walk you through five of these kind of core principles I think that we can extract out of the story that can help you in your own journey overcome self-doubt and imposter syndrome and become more confident. The first one, number one, is that anxiety is always the result of our behaviors and often our mental behaviors. So for Katie, I remember her talking about how it felt like anxiety would just sort of descend upon her as this thing that just like hit her like a bus, I think she said one time. And even though that's how it feels, a turning point for Katie was realizing that her anxiety was kind of unconsciously, she didn't know this at first, but it was the result of what she was doing. Specifically, her self-doubt, and we talk about self-doubt like it's a thing, <laughs> but really self-doubt is a verb. It's an action. It's something we do. When you, when you experience self-doubt, you are doubting yourself. It's not a passive thing. It's an active thing, right? You get in your head and you start doubting yourself and comparing yourself to other people and worrying about what might go wrong. Those are all things ultimately you're doing and that you have control over. Now it's hard if they've become habitual. It can be like any habit. It can be hard to break, but it absolutely can be changed. But the first step is is acknowledging that that's going on in the first place and that you do have the ability, you have agency over those mental habits, those ways of talking to yourself, doubting yourself, worrying about the future, comparing yourself to other people. So that was key. And I think all of us would do well to really remind ourselves of that and remember that, that if we feel anxious, there's always some sort of behavior going on. And often it's a mental behavior. It takes the form of self-talk. Um, that's causing that anxiety in the first place, okay? Number two, confidence is more situation-specific than it appears. Our tendency is to think of confidence as a personality trait. Some people are confident, some people are not. I'm not a confident person. So-and-so is super confident. I wish I was a confident person. It's not really true, <laughs> actually. Most confidence is, is tied to very specific situations. We don't realize this though, because I think at heart, a lot of us are problem solvers, which means we tend to focus on problems. So we put all our energy into the one, two, three areas of our life where we really struggle with confidence. And that's kind of all we think about because understandably we want to not be, not lack confidence in those areas. But if you really, and this would be a little, here's a little five minute assignment or a bit of homework for you. Sit down with a cup of tea and think through the different areas of your life and look for areas where you are, maybe you are very confident, have a high degree of confidence, or even just areas where you are adequately confident. You know, you're not the most confident person in the world, but you're confident enough to do the things that are important to you and that matter to you and that you enjoy. And what I think you'll find is there are actually way more of those <laughs> than there are areas where you really lack confidence. And this is a really important fact to come to terms with because it shifts you out of a fixed mindset. You know, Carol Dweck has this um, theory about fixed and gro versus growth mindset, which is really powerful. 
But thinking about confidence as a trait that you either have or don't tends to lead to this fixed mindset where you develop kind of this helplessness and hopelessness ultimately that like, well, I guess I'm just always going to be, you know, low on self-confidence. In reality, because self-confidence is so situation specific, and when you start to realize that and really remind yourself of that, you shift into a growth mindset, which is I can change the way I operate in certain circumstances and increase my confidence in those. I'm not, people aren't born confident or not. It's something that's acquired. And if you kind of put the right amount of thinking and effort into it, you can actually improve your confidence to a great degree in lots of different areas. Okay. So that's the, that's the second one is confidence is much more situation specific than we realize. The third sort of universal principle that I want to pull out of Katie's story is that the root of all anxiety is avoidance. Ultimately, what anxiety really is, is you are teaching your brain to fear something that isn't actually dangerous. Fear is the emotion we feel when we're confronted with something dangerous. You know, a bear chasing us when we're hiking, almost getting hit by a truck, something like that. Anxiety is when you feel fear, but it's in response to something that maybe looks and feels dangerous, but isn't actually dangerous. Your imagination of a colleague thinking that you're dumb. So feeling afraid in response to this imaginary hypothetical situation, that would be anxiety because that's not actually dangerous to you. Now, if you remember Katie's story, really the root of her problems was with um, anxiety and self-doubt and imposter syndrome was she had developed this habit of intellectualizing, of going to her head in order to avoid feeling that anxiety, which she wasn't very experienced at dealing with, right? So for her, intellectualizing in the form of self-doubt and worry and social comparison that was how she avoided the feeling of anxiety. But ironically, as Katie learned, and painfully, <laughs> the more you avoid anxiety, the more you compound it in the long run. Because you're teaching your brain, by running away from anxiety anytime you see it, your brain, not unsurprisingly, goes, huh, this thing must be bad. If she's constantly running away from it, it must be dangerous or a threat. So you get what's called compound anxiety. You get anxiety about anxiety. And when you get anxious about being anxious, you just get way more anxious. And round and round this vicious cycle goes to where you're getting extremely anxious over time and your confidence is just plummeting. Because you're, if you constantly run away from anxiety instead of dealing with it, again, your brain is going to learn that, hey, like they obviously suck at this. They, they really are not good at dealing with it. And so understandably, your confidence is going to be low. The kind of practical takeaway from this is if you feel anxious and you're not really sure why, look for avoidance. Ask yourself this really simple but powerful question. What am I avoiding? And if you really want to get specific, what emotions or inner experiences do I avoid and how do I avoid them? That will put you on the right track to eventually overcoming that anxiety by changing your relationship with it, changing how you respond to it. Number four. The key to overcoming anxiety is emotional confidence. Remember I told Katie, I don't think she has a confidence problem. I think she has an emotional confidence problem. I think this is one of the things actually that is just about totally universal to anyone who struggles with anxiety, low self-confidence, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, stuff like that. And the, the, the way to think about this is because anxiety and all its little buddies like worry and self-doubt and imposter syndrome, because they feel bad, we make this assumption that they are bad. And then we put all our time and energy into trying to get rid of them or solve them or fix them. But as Katie learned, of course, and I think all of us probably have some insight and, and resonance with this idea, the more you treat your anxiety like a problem, the more of a problem it starts to feel like. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So instead of running away from or trying to get rid of your anxiety, dealing with anxiety in a healthy way is about building confidence in your ability to handle it well. And that's a key thing about confidence, generally speaking. People think confidence means not feeling afraid or not feeling insecure. That's rubbish. <laughs> Everybody feels anxious and insecure sometimes. Confidence is about your tolerance of fear, not the absence of it. Right? So for Katie, the, remember those three skills I talked about? Emotional awareness, emotional validation, and willingness? By practicing those three skills, she was building her emotional confidence so that she could experience anxiety, which is inevitable. You're not going to get rid of anxiety. So just get rid of that idea that you can get rid of anxiety. It's not going to happen. The best way to deal with anxiety is to build up your confidence that you can handle it well. Okay. And that's what Katie really, really got good at. And it allowed her to become more confident and 
allowed the self-doubt and worry to kind of melt away. Now, the la- that sort of alludes to the last point that I want to pull out here, which is that confidence comes from behavior, not insights. So remember, it was only about a month to six weeks, maybe, after working with Katie that we had these this kind of insight about what was actually at the root of her problem with self-doubt and imposter syndrome. But even after we had these insights and she had, yeah, she, she, she was like, ah, I finally understand like why I'm getting anxious, why I have self-doubt, why this is so frustrating. She, she had a ton of insight. But no, if you remember, she didn't magically not feel anxious anymore just because she understood what was causing it. No, the insight was actually just the very beginning of her journey. And the truly hard work only started after the insights. Building those skills, that was the real work. So it's really important to to internalize this. Insight is necessary, but never sufficient for meaningful change. Okay, insight is necessary, but not sufficient for meaningful change. At the end of the day, we are what we habitually do, not what we know. All right, I hope you found this case study helpful. If you would like more of my thoughts and advice on overcoming anxiety, self-doubt, insecurities, and other kind of common issues in emotional health, I write a free weekly newsletter called The Friendly Mind, and you can join using the link in the description below. I will also say that if you really want to go deeper on overcoming anxiety in a more structured way, I teach a course called Creating Calm that's all about it. I teach my kind of step-by-step method for dealing with chronic worry and anxiety. So if you're interested in that, again, there's another link in the description to that course, Creating Calm. Thanks for watching.